Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra Amor and I'm here today with Will Patching. Hi Will. Hi Alexandra, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. How are things in Thailand this morning? Oh, pretty warm as usual. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very nice place to be. Um, beautiful scenery, spectacular place. I live on the island of Phuket, oh, so it's okay. a tourist destination, so I'm very, very lucky. Oh, that is nice. Well, that's lucky. Well, by way of introduction, I'm just going to tell everyone a little little bit about you. Uh, Will Patching is the author of Remorseless, a British crime thriller featuring forensic psychiatrist Dr. Powers and London Metropolitan Police Officer D.I. Jack Carver. Carver assists Dr. Powers as he tries to unravel the truth about violent psychopath Peter Leach while battling demons of his own. So first I want to ask you, Peter, uh, um, about... You've got a website dedicated to psychopaths, mm -hmm. and as we were talking about just before the call, um, we we talked about how your book is is quite gritty. Um, you've I think I saw it described somewhere as a British noir thriller, yes. which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and someone I noticed one of your reviewers uh, described it as relentless. So, yeah. I, are those the types of books you like to read as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've, I've been reading all sorts of books since I was a, a bookworm as a child. Mm -hmm. And um, mysteries and thrillers and crime fiction, for me, has been the biggest draw. And I think it's the most popular genre, generally anyway, with everyone. So, um, for me, that was an area where I'd love to read and I always wanted to write. But uh, I find that psychopaths are particularly fascinating. And I wanted to create a novel where uh, the one of the key uh, individuals, the villain, Peter Leach in this case, mm -hmm. uh, is actually a genuine psychopath. And um, to put readers into his mind as part of that, and a lot of people have found that quite a, a difficult thing. It's a little more disturbing than most people are used to because they're, they're in the driving seat, as it were, with this absolutely crazy guy, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's, it's gritty, it's dark, it's not a, a normal procedural uh, detective story but it has a big element of mystery in it uh, which is why of course we're talking <laughs> yes yeah exactly and so I looked at your website you have one specifically dedicated to information about psychopaths so that must be a topic that really fascinates you yes um, I had a run-in with somebody that at the time I didn't realize was a psychopath and uh, I was down at the time, and he took advantage of me. Mm. And it wasn't until after that event that I started looking into uh, the different character defects that people have, uh, genuine psychopathic uh, nature. And I realized that's what I'd been tangling with. And uh, he actually became the inspiration for my criminal psychopath, Peter Leach. But uh, as far as I know, he's never murdered anyone. Uh, as far as I know, too, I've never met anyone who's murdered anyone. But um, it was the inspiration. And, and with my background from reading a lot of crime fiction, I decided that he would make a great character in this um, novel, uh, Remorseless. And he is a relentless character. He's, mm. uh, it's a hallmark of psychopaths, is that if they're wronged in any way or if they have an objective... They will go for it, and they will continue doing whatever they need to do at anyone else's expense to get to their goal. And I tried to make this, uh, this novel a relentless experience for the reader as well, the feeling that it, it keeps on going and going and going. And uh, you get inside the mind of the psychopath, which again is a little bit against convention. Normally when uh, you're... Uh, I don't know if you've ever had any classes on writing, but we're told uh, you shouldn't be in the point of view of somebody that the readers can't sympathise with or empathise with. And of course, nobody really wants to be a psychopath, but I put you inside the mind of this guy for quite a bit of the, the actual novel. And for some people, that's quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. For others, of course, it's a, a thrill ride, a bit like being on a roller coaster. You know, you know you're safe, but actually... You know, it's thrilling. So it's dark, it's gritty, and it's not for everyone. It's not a procedural, uh, but there is elements of mystery and detection and so on in it. Right, so yes, that's... yeah. And I think, you know, there are fans of that kind of grittier book, even the, even the types of books where you go into the mind of the bad guy. And Thomas Harris comes to mind, right? Yes. 
And there's an author here in Canada named Giles Blunt, and he writes uh, kind of procedural mystery novels. But what he mm -hmm. does tend to do is is go inside the mind of the bad guy in alternating chapters. And mm. um, so, yeah, I, 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 I really admire that as a, as a technique. It's, it's unusual. It's against convention. But yes, yes of course, we we'll do it. I, I just wish I had half the success that Thomas Harris has had. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I'd like to be compared with him, but I'm not really. I, I, I couldn't say that. But yes, it's um, it's a different way of approaching it, and the the theme of the novel is actually guilt. Okay. So remorse less is remorse free, and psychopaths have this as part of their their innate character. It's a trait, a clinical, observable feature of being a psychopath. They have no guilt, mm -hmm. so they they don't have the internal policeman that you and I would have that stops us from doing bad things to other people right. because we know right. we're going to feel bad about it. Well, if you have no remorse, you're remorse free, guilt free, remorse less. Then of course you have no internal mechanism that's going to control your behaviour, and it's only the external forces that keep psychopaths under control, and. Um, the, the experts in psychopaths, the true experts, believe that a lot of people who are in positions of power, um, presidents in the past, I did not have sex with that woman, uh, people like that, um, have been identified as possibly psychopathic in nature. And uh, they, they do get in, into positions of power. Most of them aren't in prison. They're all around us. And it's roughly 1% of the population. So for me, this is... This was a fascinating discovery, and I wanted to create this novel where the guilt-free element of Peter Leach, the villain, yeah. is contrasted yeah. with Dr. Powers, who's my forensic psychiatrist, who's suffering from major guilt trauma mm. because of a car accident that involved his family. So um, these two things are, are two opposing forces that are in the book. And also this relentless nature of Peter Leach, the, the criminal who's up for parole. But the element of mystery is the, the interesting thing, I think, for, for maybe a lot of the people that are watching this now. And that comes about from the very opening. We realise that Peter Leach, who's in prison for killing his parents on his 18th birthday, who's up for parole 18 years later, which happens in England, is a killer. We see very early on that he is a killer. So we know he is a psychopath. He's all the things that we think he is. But he claims that he didn't kill his parents, but that his brother did. So the element of mystery from the beginning is, is he lying or is he telling the truth? And the fact is, psychopaths love to lie. They mm -hmm. actually enjoy it. They like pulling the wool over other people's, uh, over, over other people's eyes. They get a thrill out of treating us like objects to be manipulated. And this is um, a fundamental aspect of a psychopath's character. And again, I explore it a little within the novel, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not an academic study. It's just my story that I really enjoyed creating. And these characters, when I created them, took on a life of their own. Um, I don't know about the writing process for you, but for me it's very much uh, something that... Uh, originally I'd read, oh, you must do all of this planning, you plan out every chapter, you have, you must know where you're going. And I, I studied English to advanced level at, at, at school and, mm. and so on. So I knew about how to compose and, and write and so on. And it didn't really work for me because every time I sat down and planned out a novel, and over the years I've tried a few times, uh, I ended up getting bored because I knew what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So with the novels that I now write, and I have two already, and I have uh, another one in train, which is the follow-up to Remorses, um, I actually start off in the way that Stephen King suggested in his fantastic semi-autobiographical uh, work on writing, mm -hmm. in which he talks about his past, but also he talks about the process of writing. Absolutely fantastic book not just for uh, writers, but for readers and anyone who, who likes Stephen King. Mm -hmm. But within that, he suggests that rather than doing all of the planning and you know, having a synopsis for each chapter and you know, backstory for every one of your characters, he suggests doing what he calls spitballing. 
And it's a term I wasn't familiar with because I'm a Brit, um, but I understood immediately what he meant. And from that, uh, you just come up with some ideas. And uh, I had like five headlines, uh, which were really questions. And they were what if questions. And one of them was, what if a guy is in prison for killing his parents? What if he blames his brother? What if he's up for parole? Mm-hmm. Um, what if there's a, 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 a protagonist, you know, a forensic psychiatrist, who's also suffering from his own problems, who's involved in some way? And I put all of this together and I set the characters running. And uh, it, they took on a life of their own, which for me was fantastic because there are twists in this tale that I didn't know were coming myself. They mm-hmm. actually did some things that surprised me. And for me as a writer, it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I got the main story down within a couple of weeks, really. And then after that, there was a lot of work to do to put it all back together and make it all work um, because some of the opening scenes that I had didn't fit with what the characters did later on. So I had to sort of rewrite some of the early parts. Very different way to how we're taught to write. But for me, it works. And... uh, yeah, it uh, also helped with the relentless nature of the novel to try and keep it keep it moving all the time. Um, but having said that, there's some quite detailed character study in it. It's a uh, quite a long novel. It's 122,000 words now. Wow. So uh, a lot of novels are around the 70 to 80,000 mark. And uh, I I like a novel where I can get my teeth into it. And I hope. <laughs> hope there are readers out there who are like me, and I know there are because I've had some fantastic feedback from people. I've also had a couple who said they couldn't finish the novel as well because it is quite dark and disturbing. So it's horses for courses, really. Some people will enjoy it, some people won't want to read it. But, uh, yeah, and uh, talking about the characters taking on a life of their own, um, again, I don't know about you, but when I read a book, I can hear the characters inside my head. Mm-hmm. So when there's a, any dialogue at all... I can hear them talking. And I, I've got this mind movie going on. Well, the same thing happened when I was writing. And I just finished uh, recording the audio book version of The Morseless, oh, uh, which will be available in, in, yeah, from January in 2016. Yeah. So uh, yeah. when I was trying to become these characters for the novel, I, I wanted to try and emulate the voices I could hear in my head for the listener to hear, rather than creating their own when they read the story themselves. And uh, I actually read the the novel aloud three times before actually starting recording, as practice runs, and each each time took me probably 14 or 15 hours. And the the entire recording is now 13 hours. So there's been quite a lot of work going into the audio book. And I think I've got the character voices quite well. In fact, what I'll do is um, uh, I'll give you a link or I can send you some clips from the audio as well. And uh, you can have a, have a listen to what I sound like when I'm not sounding like me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> For me, again, this was um, a fantastic experience to be able to make the characters properly come alive mm-hmm. and actually hear them back. And when I listen to the recording afterwards, I think, is that really me? The most difficult bit, actually, was the ladies, of course, because, you know, I don't have the the equipment, (laughs) really. (laughs) Yes. But I did my best with that and tried to make them sound as near as I could to the the voices in my head. (laughs) Right, yeah. I hear voices. I hear voices. (laughs) yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting thing, and uh, I I'd never thought about doing an audio book. I've, I've listened to a number, and again, if if you don't have a lot of time, if you're down the gym, or if you're out for a walk, or even just commuting to work, uh, it can be a much easier experience listening with your own headphones than it is trying to read. And in some places, you just can't read. I mean, it's difficult if you're out for a walk, even if you're holding your your Kindle reader or whatever. So I think. For the future, more and more people will be listening to books as well. So for our industry, uh, it's gone from paper-based, uh, everyone being dictated to as what they can read, to now where there's e-books and independent publishers like, like us. Yeah. Uh, putting books out there for readers who like the books that we produce. 
And the next step, I think, in this will be the delivery of audiobooks through the internet. And it's all starting to take off now. So, um, again, I, I strongly recommend it, but it's a huge amount of work. It really is. Oh, took yes. Me, took me probably three months in total of, of working most days on it. Yeah. So. yeah, wow, that sounds like a huge project. Well, it, it was for me. I mean, if you're a professional and you're, you're able to, to voice characters and you can read fluently and you don't have lots of what they call mouth noise, which is all the clicks and pops that we probably can't hear on here, but when you're recording for an audio book, there's, there's nothing else. There's no distraction. It's just you and a microphone. Yeah. Uh, you you realise how noisy you are, or at least I did. So all of that has to be uh, taken out or minimised. But, yeah, it was a, a great experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the, the worrying thing was I was walking around the house in character, and at one point I was speaking to Leech, my villain, and he's not a nice man at all. And I ended up shouting and swearing at the refrigerator, and my wife overheard this, and she thought there was an intruder in the house. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I had to reassure her that actually I don't have a split personality. I really am me, and it was just you know me in character trying to get prepared for my recording session. So it's been great fun. The actual novel itself, writing the novel, was a, a thrill for me, and I just love hearing from readers as well. And over the years, um, because the book is not a new book, it's been out for years. Um, I've actually made quite a lot of changes based on reader feedback. And uh, it's now what I consider to be the final version. But uh, over the best part of 10 years, I've been taking feedback from people and amalgamating some of that into the, the novel itself. So I think it's about as good as I can make it. And I'm very happy with it now. Oh, that's great. And I mean, a couple of things I want to follow up on. So you're obviously very interested in the characters, which is which really intriguing to me because I love character-based fiction. You know, I'd, I'd like a strong plot, but I'm as interested um, in the characters and how they interact and who they are and where they came from, why they are the way they are. And one really cool thing I think you've done is you've got background information on your characters on the Remorseless website. That's right. Which I thought was really cool. And you've even shown a little um, a character sketch. Was it, I think, was it Doc Powers or... or yes. Yes. Where you where you were starting to begin to build the character. Mm. Yes, but as I said, I, I didn't have um, a lot of background information, and it was just some headlines, really, to get me started. Mm -hmm. And the characters developed through the novel, and I think that makes it more interesting to... If it's interesting to me as a writer, I, I hope it's going to translate into the reading experience for the, the reader at the end of the day. So, um, for me... Yes, I love to get into the minds of people, uh, all sorts of different people. That's that's part of the joy of writing. Yes, um, yes. And you are sort of godlike in a way. It's a <laughs> so, but you create these fictional characters who, in your own mind, are actually almost real. Um, I killed off somebody in, in my other novel, actually, and uh, I came close to tears. And I, I had to take myself outside for a good talking to because... I, I was thinking, I don't, I don't want to kill him. I can't kill him. I can't. No, no, no. And then I did. And then it was, oh, no. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a bit worrying in a way, but uh, no, I think it's, it's this experience where you, you set these characters running and you're, yeah. you've got this sort of godlike view of what's going on because you know what's in every character's head, whereas, of course, in real life we don't. But yes. if, you were, if you were the Almighty, then you would know. So, um, again, for me, this, this understanding of characters is an important thing. So, as I said, it's not a procedural. It, it's, it's partly a, a psychological suspense. It's partly a crime mystery. And it's partly thriller, out-and-out -out thriller. So it sort of goes through phases as you read. And I actually had that feedback from one reader. It's like three genres in one, really. Um, which, of course, makes it very difficult for a, a normal publisher. They, they like their, their particular genre to be a genre because it's easy to sell, they can brand it, and they can push it. Yeah. But, of course, readers don't want that, and I think that's one of the great things about the Internet now and this new indie publishing phenomenon where people like us can put our books up and, you know, even if just a few thousand people read, at least, you know, you've, you've got those people there. Um, and, you know, without the big backup of a, a publishing house 
let's find a different thing to get going. Mm-hmm. Once you've found your readers and you've got your niche, uh, it's a great thing. As I mm-hmm. said, you get feedback from the readers too, and it's a nice virtuous circle. Yeah. But on the Remorseless website, you're right, there, there is some backstory. There's not a lot, and I, I put up the backstory that I was asked about by readers. Oh, so okay. if readers ask me something, I will put more up. Um, and the, the one thing I would say is if people haven't read the novel, they need to be careful because the backstory does contain, the backstory section on remorselessthriller.com does actually contain some spoilers. So okay. uh, if people do want the book and want to read it and they, they want the surprises and the twists, don't look at that part of the website. In <laughs> fact, they put a big flag up to say spoilers on that page. Right, Just yes, that. yeah, I think I saw that too, yeah. Um, and so you have the follow-up to Remorseless is coming out in 2016, correct? Yes, I, I said Christmas 2016, but my plans are to actually do it sooner than that. And mm-hmm. what I'd like to do is to, to do a sort of pre-release launch and send it out to my uh, readers to give me some feedback, sort of early readers, and then to tweak and do whatever is necessary to satisfy that feedback, and then do a formal launch later in the year. Uh, so I've set a target for Christmas next year, but I'm, I'm thinking it will be a lot sooner. I've, uh, I've got about half of it done already, so... Oh, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm almost there. And my other novel is a slightly different novel. It's, um, it's more of an adventure crime thriller. Um, so I've got the two novels, and the characters within both novels will become... Probably trilogies. Uh, I have in mind three novels for each. Uh, I don't want to go beyond that because when I read a lot of series that go into five, six, seven, eight, uh, I, I stop reading after that number because it's, it's just too much. I find I get bored with the characters. So mm. I don't want that to happen to my characters and I don't want that to that experience for my readers. So I think probably after three novels, a trilogy, which is what I've got in mind for each, and I already have ideas of how that can pan out. Um, that's what I'm planning to do over the next two years. So now I've got the time to write. I will yes. write more. Yes. That's... Oh, good for you. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so your other book is called The Hack, correct? Mm-hmm. And it was previously traditionally published, is that right? Yes. Uh, in fact, both novels were published um, in 2000, well, it was actually 2007, it actually hit the shelves, only in Asia. And it was uh, a small publishing house in Bangkok. Mm. But the financial crisis came along and basically murdered that company. Uh, so that was the end of that. And the idea was that um, because I live in Asia, uh, we would have the book in um, the bookshops that pander to expatriates, you know, like myself, people who are living abroad who are English speakers, and also to expand into uh, Hong Kong and then to Australia and New Zealand, mm-hmm. uh, but not that happened, the, the company uh, just folded, uh, so I spent some time licking my wounds, mm-hmm. and then decided to rewrite both novels, which I did in 2012, and I've updated them again for 2015 for the launch of the audiobook, and also got into the characters completely now, so that I can do the trilogies. So that's where I am with it, Alexandra, it's uh, taken some time, but I'm, I'm getting there. Oh, that's good for you. That's fantastic. It's nice. You know what? It doesn't matter if we, if or when we fall. It's how we get back up again, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and did you? Was there any trouble for you getting the rights back for those books? No problem at all. I didn't give up any rights. Oh, okay. Um, it was a full publishing house, and right from the outset, we had an agreement that at any time I could pretty much walk away. I had to give him twelve months' notice, but that was it. Okay. But when he, when he folded, he said, no problem at all, do what you like, and I did. <laughs> good for you. Oh, that's good. Well, it's been great talking to you today, Will. So tell people yeah. where they can find out more about your book. It's remorselessthriller.com. Dot yes. com. Remorselessthriller.com. Okay. Uh, I actually have three websites, but if they go there, there are links to the other websites if they're more interested in finding out something about psychopaths. The other side is very readable. It's not a, an academic site. It's designed for you know, people like myself, lay people, to, to actually read. And obviously I have another website for the other book called thehacknovel.com. But yeah, remorselessthriller.com is the one that relates to the audio book and the conversation we've had today. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for talking to me and all the best. And thank you too. All okay. the best to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.